Welcome everybody to the second edition of the IFIMA plus ICMA joint seminar series on condensed matter physics. Before starting, let me announce that in this 21-22 course, we will be able to enjoy not only our traditional fully online seminars like in the past year, but also hybrid format seminars with both online and on-site participation. This is actually the case of today. Our first speaker is on campus at the Material Science Institute of Madrid. And now I'm going to give the floor to Oksana chubikalo Fesenko, who is going to chair this session. She will be taking questions at the end of the talk. And I also want to tell you that uh, online, you can also ask questions by raising your hand. And at the end, I will give you also the floor. Thank you very much for being here. And now, please, Oksana, you can start. Thank you very much, Elsa, for this introduction. As it was already announced, this talk is a joint, a part of joint seminars from the Material Science Institute of Madrid and Condensed Matter Physics Institute of Autonomous University of Madrid. And also this talk is a part of the Distinguished Lecture Series of IEEE Magnetic Society. And it is my pleasure today to introduce you Matthias Chloe, who is a well, very well-known specialist in spintronics and nanomagnetism, and he is a distinguished lecturer of IEEE Magnetic Society of this year. Uh, Matthias is a professor at the University of Mainz in Germany, and also in the Center of Quantum Spintronics in Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology. He is also a director of the Graduate School for Excellence of the Mainz University. Uh, he has been actively working in spintronics and nanomagnetism. A little bit about his biography. He made his PhD in Cambridge University and then his postdoc in IBM and Zurich. And then he also worked in EPFL in Switzerland, as well as the University of Constance in Germany, and now he is working in the University of Mainz. His interests are related to nanomagnetism, spintronics, with very broad subjects within these topics related to antiferromagnetic spintronics, magnetization, dynamics, graphene spintronics, and all similar topics in this area. And now I give you the floor, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for coming to have this lecture here. Okay, well, thanks, Oksana. It's uh, really kind uh, of uh, for hosting me here. And I'm very happy that Oksana and Akash uh, allowed me to be here in person. So this is really great to see so many live faces. Typically in the last two years, I've been giving talks by Zoom, looking into black screens. So this is a lot better. And therefore, I'm also going to take a picture just, uh, you know, for one of the few moments in the IEEE Magnetic Society DL talks where I actually have an auditorium with live people. So this makes, you know, this is, uh, makes it such a good experience. And, you know, weather is great. Food is great. People are great. So we're looking, I'm looking forward to a couple of uh, really exciting discussions after this as well. Yeah, as Oksana said, um, I'm from Mainz and Trondheim. And today I'm going to give you a very introductory lecture on antiferromagnetism. And I'm going to try and show you what it takes to make antiferromagnetism useful. Uh, and that is how to write it, how to read it, and how to transport information in antiferromagnets. So these are the three main topics. And as Oksana said, this is part of an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer. A tour and therefore I'm going to have one slide of advertising for you. So this is the IEEE Magnetic Society, um, which is the largest learned society in magnetism in the world. And I encourage you to become a member because we organize summer schools. So if you're a student, please bother your supervisor to go to one of our summer schools. We pay for everything. We have newsletters and magnetism because eventually you also need to get a job. Um, we uh, publish a number of important journals, such as IEEE Transactions on Magnetics and Magnetics Letters. And also, if you are not in for magnetism, have a look at this video, which is very nice to introduce magnetism and why it's important also to your friends and family. And finally, we organize the Distinguished Lecture Series, where every year four lecturers are chosen in order to 
travel the world and give talks. And this has been in the last two years, Masashi Shiraishi, Tim Medes, Bert Kupmat, and myself. And I also encourage you to listen at their talks, which you can find on YouTube, or please invite them to come here. And finally, because a lot of us are still sitting at home quite a lot, if you want to stay up to date with what's hot in magnetism, there are three excellent online seminar series, which are hosted by the SPY Center in Mainz, the uh, OSSS in um, Nebraska, Lincoln, and Denver, and the Petaspin seminar series hosted in Messina. Okay, enough advertising. Let's start with science. So why antiferromagnets? Well, if you believe this guy here, which is Louis Niel, then antiferromagnets are interesting but useless. That's what he said in 1970 when he got a Nobel Prize. And well, you know, these guys who get a Nobel Prize, they tend to know what they're doing. But, you know, I definitely agree that they're interesting. But the question about useless, that's something that has been intriguing me. Are they really as useless as Louis, Louis Niel thought? So fundamentally, they could have many advantages. Now, if you compare ferromagnets and antiferromagnets, then in a ferromagnet, you store information in a bit where the magnetization is pointing to the right or pointing to the left. And now, if you want to actually switch the bit from left to right or right to left, then what you find is that there is stray field interactions. And the stray field interactions from the stray field generated by our magnetic bit means that this bit here, which has two neighbors that are pointing in the opposite direction, and this bit here, which has two neighbors pointing in the same direction, will have a different energy for switching from right to left. And this means that switching becomes less robust. And if you bring these bits very close to each other, then they will interact so strongly that you can actually not stabilize both these states to the right and to the left. And so what you also see is that we store the information in a 180 degree different direction of the magnetization. Now, this is drastically different in antiferromagnets. In the simplest case, in an antiferromagnet, you have two sublattices, antiparallel sublattices. And these two sublattices mean that there is no net stray field because these completely compensate each other. And that means that you can bring the bit as close as you want. They will not interact. Furthermore, it means that we cannot store the information in right, left, or left, right, because for most magnets, you cannot distinguish. So this means we cannot have a 180 degree different orientation, but a 90 degree different orientation. And actually, this direction of the two sublattices, horizontal or vertical, we call this the nail vector. Formally, that's the difference between the two sublattices. So here, the nail vector is pointing in the horizontal direction. And here it's pointing in the vertical direction. So theoretically, this would mean in antiferromagnets, we can have a hundred times higher storage density than in ferromagnets. So this should be exciting. Now, one of the difficulties uh, and also one of the advantages of antiferromagnets are that, in contrast to ferromagnets, where you have a large susceptibility, so a magnetic field manipulates them. In antiferromagnets, the susceptibility is a factor 10,000 or 100,000 smaller, meaning that magnetic fields cannot be used to manipulate them easily. But on the other hand, they're very stable against magnetic fields. So once you have set the bit uh, like this or like that, if there are stray fields, it doesn't matter. Another difference is that if you look at the energy scales, the highest energy scale for antiferromagnets is the antiferromagnetic coupling between the two sublattices. So this so-called inter-sublattice inter coupling is of the order of a thousand Tesla or so, and it sets the transverse susceptibility. The next highest energy scale is the inter-sublattice, um, uh, sorry, the intra-sublattice coupling that couples two spins of the same sublattice parallel, and that can be of the order of a hundred Tesla or so, and together these set the nail temperature, the ordering temperature. And what is important is that these energy scales are so high that we can never reach them in the lab. There's no way to generate a thousand Tesla in your lab. So there's no way that you can get the two sublattices to go parallel. So they will always stay under parallel. But there's a third energy scale, and that is the reorientation of our two sublattices 
which are still anti-parallel, but they can go from horizontal to vertical. And that can be set by the anisotropy, which can be small and can lead to an achievable so-called spin swap field of around a few Tesla. So this is potentially achievable in the lab. So what else is different? These very strong anti-parallel coupling of our two sublattices leads to very high frequencies for the eigenmode dynamics which is typically in antiferromagnets in the terahertz regime, so-called exchange enhanced, and in ferromagnets is in the gigahertz regime. And since this eigenmode dynamics sets the ultimate switching speed, it would mean we can switch our antiferromagnets a thousand times faster than a ferromagnet. So that's really good. So we can switch from vertical to horizontal a thousand times faster on the femtosecond time scale than for ferromagnets from left to right. So potentially that's super exciting. And something that many of you don't know is that there are actually many more antiferromagnets than ferromagnets. So why is that? If I look at, let's say, collinear antiferromagnets, where we just have two sublattices, there are already a lot of ways that I can generate antiferromagnetic coupling where you have zero net stray field. For instance, by having one layer all up, one layer down, one layer up, and that's so-called A type. Or within a layer, we can have up and down, and then this is the same through all the layers. Or within a layer, we can have up and down, and this and alternates as well. So already for this very simple collinear antiferromagnet, there are many different ways to get antiferromagnetic coupling. And this is actually realized in, in, um, in real materials. For instance, nickel oxide is a material which is such a layered antiferromagnet where we can see that one layer has all the spins to the left and one layer, the next layer, the one on one plane has all the spins to the right and so on. There's also manganese to gold, which I'm going to talk about more, where again, we have one layer with the spin up, one layer spin down, one layer spin up, one layer spin down and so on. So this already shows you there are different ways to couple these spins antiferromagnetically for collinear antiferromagnetic. But it gets even more complex and more exciting. You can also have so-called non-collinear antiferromagnets, where you see that the spins are pointing in all kinds of directions. But if you average over one plaquette, then the zero, the, spin, the net spin is zero. So all the spins together, if you sum this up, is zero. And these are so-called coplanar antiferromagnets, non-collinear coplanar, and it can be even more complex. Where you see spins pointing out of the plane or into the plane. So here the spin is pointing like this, and this is like this, and this. So you see here, again, if your average over one plaquette is zero, but there's a lot of very complex exchange coupling happening with the spins pointing in all kinds of directions. And so this means, because you can have so many different types of coupling, there are many, many materials that can have antiferromagnetic coupling. Another thing that is not so well known is that the magnetoelastic coupling, i.e., the coupling between strain and the nail order or magnetization, sublattice magnetization direction in ferromagnets is typically weak compared to antiferromagnets. And that is important because strain can be generated with very low power and therefore we can potentially switch with very low power. And now, okay, the exchange interaction in ferromagnets, it's simple, all the spins have to point in the same direction. So it's typical Heisenberg exchange. But you saw in antiferromagnets, you can have all these very complex exchange interactions leading to complex ordering. So this is more interesting, but also more difficult. Actually, in this talk, I'm going to limit myself to simple collinear antiferromagnets. And the non-collinear ones, they are super exciting, but you have to go to a more advanced talk and you know, invite someone smarter than me to work on that. Now, finally, useful. Yes, of course, ferromagnets are useful. You have them in hard drives, magnetic sensors. You know, there are many, many applications of ferromagnets. At the moment, antiferromagnets are only used as passive elements for exchange biasing of spin valves. In order to make them active elements, you need to measure and control them. And so the take home message here is antiferromagnets are definitely interesting and possibly useful even as active elements. 
Now you might be, you know, very bored and uh, you might want to, you know, fall asleep now. So let me give you one slide as the take home message of this talk today. And then please go ahead, the people that are online, you could go and grab a coffee. And the people here, you have to be kind enough and just sleep without interrupting. So the main message here is ferromagnets are manipulated by magnetic field, that's Earth's field, and that's 19th century physics. Antiferromagnets can be manipulated by staggered nail spin orbit torques, and that's 21st century physics. So very exciting, very boring. That's the take home message. All right, so now comes the real science. Um, so first, if you want to actually use antiferromagnets, we need to determine in which directions does the nail vector orient. Is it horizontal, vertical, or something else? So in order for that, we need to read out the antiferromagnetic order. And we can do this with different means. One of the most direct way of doing that is, is using imaging. And we start with nickel oxide, this material, which has these collinear uh, 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 layers of um, spins pointing down and spins pointing up or left and right. And indeed, there's actually 12 different orientations that the spins can point, these T and S domains. And in order to determine that, we need to have a method that is sensitive to the orientation of our nil vector. And that is so-called X-ray magnetic linear dichroism. So what we do is we use an X-ray beam. We shoot this X-ray beam at our sample. And now, depending on the orientation of the polarization of our X-ray beam, with respect to the direction of our nail vector, so the sublattice, you get a different absorption of the X-rays. You see here, the red and the, and the black uh, uh, curves, they don't overlap. And if you do the difference, you see here a different signal. And this is an absorption of a linearly polarized X-ray beam. Let's say the linear polarization is like this. And the nail vector is pointing like this. Then you absorb more than if the nail vector is like that. And thereby, you can determine the orientation of the nail vector if it's parallel or perpendicular to our polarization direction. And now we can be smart and we can orient, reorient the orientation of our polarization and we can rotate the sample. And by that, we can get the full three-dimensional information of the two sublattices. Which way are they pointing in space? And that's what we did. So here, this is a nickel oxide where we have different domains. And by varying the orientation, you can see here that the contrast changes drastically. And this then allows us to determine from a fit of the angular dependence of our signal, the orientation of our nail vector. And it turns out in nickel oxide, we don't, in thin film nickel oxide grown on NGO, we don't get all the 12 different orientations, but due to strain, we get only four. And that's great because it simplifies our life. We have just four directions, which are along these 5519 directions. If you're interested, here is the paper. And by the way, since this is an IEEE DL talk, I'm very happy to share all the slides with anyone who's interested. At the last slide, I'll put my email address. If you're interested, send me an email. I'm very happy to share the slides. OK, so this direct imaging allows you to determine the orientation of our nail vector. Now, if you talk to companies like you know, SC Microelectronics, Intel, or Samsung, they are not interested in putting a synchrotron into their device. They are always interested in electrical readout. How can we electrically read out the information? Well, it turns out that that's also possible. It's possible due to something called spin hall magneto resistance. Now, this is a bit more complex um, uh, process where we put on top of our antiferromagnet with a nail vector here. These are the two sublattices. We put a platinum wire. And in the platinum, we generate by the spin hall effect a spin current that leads to a spin accumulation at the interface. And now, if the spin accumulation S has an angle with the direction of the nail vector, it can enter into the antiferromagnet. But if the spin accumulation S is completely parallel to the nail vector, then it is reflected back into the platinum and by the inverse spin hole effect generates a charge current that we can measure. So essentially, the resistance of our platinum wire depends on the dot product squared between the direction of the nail vector and the direction of the spins in the spin accumulation. And so this was first uh, pioneered for ferromagnets here by Nakayama et al. And we then looked at this for antiferromagnets. So what we did is we have nickel oxide and we change the orientation of our two sublattices and we orient them in different directions. And then we measure the resistance. 
And this was first pioneered in the group of Bart van Wees and later by the Western Gernwein's group and us. And we see this sine squared dependence. So that's exactly what we expect. Sine squared dependence of the orientation of our nail vector with respect to the direction of the spins in the spin accumulation. So this works really well. Here's some information on that. Okay, that's great. Now it turns out that of course this works for insulating materials because you put your platinum on top. How about for conducting materials? So here we have a conducting antiferromagnet, manganese to gold. Again, it has this nail vector. We can do the imaging and then we can see that here we have an in-plane nail order. The gray domains mean the nail order is pointing in the vertical direction and black means nail order is pointing in the horizontal direction. Huh? Subletters like this or like that. And we can actually also make this more monodomain. You see here it's by and large gray it means that all the nail vector is pointing in the uh, vertical direction. And now what we do is we can measure the resistance and we see that if our uh, current is flowing parallel to the nail order, the resistance is low. And if our current is flowing perpendicular to the nail order, the resistance is high. So from just measuring the resistance of manganese to gold, we can determine the direction of the nail order. This is not such a big effect. It's 0.15%. It's an anisotropic magneto resistance effect, but it allows you by a simple resistance measurement to read out the direction of the nail order. And we actually did this also in the optical regime where we measured optical dichroism. This paper just came out two weeks ago. And we find that the effect is four times larger. It's 0.6%, still not huge, but it's relatively sizable. Okay, so this is good. Um, now, one of the problems is that these effects are still small. So if I look at the effect that I would like to have for a real device, so for instance, if I want to sell this to Samsung or Intel or Infineon, they would like to have 100% change or 200% change, not 1% or 0.1%. So how can we do that? Now, in order to look at possibilities to have a large effect, we actually couple our manganese to gold to permaloy. And permaloy is a ferromagnet. And with this ferromagnet, we can generate a very high magneto resistance effect of 200% or so. So the question is, how good does the manganese to gold couple to the permalloy? And it turns out that firstly, we see that the permalloy has a very high coercivity of the order of half a Tesla or so. Secondly, we see if we look at the image of the domains in the permalloy, they look like what we expect from the manganese to gold. And to demonstrate that, we actually went to the synchrotron and we measured with XMLD beam and uh, the, the manganese or the antiferromagnet as well as the ferromagnet. And you see they're perfectly identical. This means that every domain in the antiferromagnet is completely visible in the ferromagnet. And that's great because it means we can use the ferromagnet to read out the antiferromagnet. But the question is, of course, why? Why should there be so strong coupling between the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet? And for that, we did some TM imaging where we saw something interesting. And that is our manganese to gold always terminates with the gold layer. So if it terminates with this gold layer, the top interface magnetic layer is manganese A side pointing to the right. If we terminate with this gold, we also have as a top magnetic layer, the manganese A side with the spins pointing to the right. So that means at the interface between the manganese to gold and the permalloy, we always have the same spins. And that means that at this interface, we have ferromagnetic coupling between the uh, permalloy and this top layer. And everywhere, even at step edges, we have this perfect coupling. And that leads to exchange bias of 30 Tesla. So really exchange coupled ex uh, uh, interfaces. And that means our permalloy is a perfect reflection of the manganese to gold. And now we can read out permalloy with 100% TMR. And therefore, this allows us to read out the antiferromagnet with 100% TMR. And that's what you need for a device. If you're interested, the papers on archive and hopefully will be coming out soon. Okay, and now finally, just uh, 2D magnets. Many people get super excited about 2D magnets, so do we. I think 2D magnets are really interesting because in a layered antiferromagnet such as this chromium trichloride, 
you have a single monolayer, which is a ferromagnet, a bilayer, which is a perfectly compensated antiferromagnet, a trilayer is a ferromagnet, and so on. And we looked at chromium thiophosphate. Indeed, we see this cosine squared dependence. So we see these type of signals, even in these 2D materials. So I think that's a super exciting area which we are going into, and we're just writing up the first uh, work. Okay, let's sum this up. So I've shown you we can read out antiferromagnets with different means. We can do electrical readout by spin hall magnetic resistance and AMR. Small, but it's there. We can do X ray magnetic linear dichroism and combined with X ray microscopy and optical dichroism. And what I find very interesting is this exchange bias coupling, which allows you to have large electrical readouts. And there are also other mechanisms that I didn't have time to go into. But again, if you're interested, send me an email. I'm happy to share the slides so you don't need to write down all the references. Okay, so we can read out the antiferromagnetic information, and that's pretty good. But of course, we also need to write it. You know, just reading out is great, but we somehow need to write it. So how can we write antiferromagnetic information? Well, I told you that um, the susceptibility to magnetic fields is typically very small. So if I apply a field, the two sub lattices, they can't a little bit, so let's say like this, they can't a little bit in one direction, but this is strongly exaggerated. This very strong anti-parallel coupling of a thousand Tesla means that if I apply a field, the canting will be very little, so just milliwatt or so. But still, this small canted moment here would like to align with the applied field. So if I apply a field this direction, my nail vector would like to orient in the horizontal direction. And if I now apply the field this direction, sorry, if I uh, now try to <laughs> apply field in this direction, the nail vector would like to cant that way. So by changing the field direction, I can cant the small moment. I can generate a small moment by small canting, but still that reorients the nail vector by 90 degrees, always in a direction perpendicular to the current. And finally, if you have extremely strong fields and low exchange, you can also have the spin flip, but we don't consider this here. But let's check if that really works. So we go back to our favorite material, manganese to gold. And then when we apply a strong field, in this case, 50 Tesla, we see that indeed from the XNLD spectrum, there's first a dip and then a peak. And if we change the direction by 90 degrees, there's first a peak and then a dip. So we have reoriented the direction of our nail vector by 90 degrees. Now, this, of course, 50 Tesla is not something that Intel is going to put into their devices. So how can we actually do writing with smaller fields? So it turns out we can actually use strain. So what we do here is we use this medieval torture device where you put your sample on this central bar here, and then we squeeze it and we tighten the screws to exert some strain until either the sample confesses or dies. And sometimes it first dies, sometimes it first confesses. So let's see what happens when we, when we tighten the screws to generate a little bit of strain to our sample. We see in the unstrained sample, there is no big signal, but when we strain the sample and just generate 0.1% difference in the length, then we see first the peak and then the dip. So we have reoriented our nail vector in the vertical direction. So this really works. But again, we can't put this medieval torture device into our, into our, our CMOS. We need to have electrical generation of strain. And this actually works as well. So we can use PNNPT, which is a peer to electric material, and we can apply voltages. And these then generate a strain. And this strain then generates actually a change in the anisotropy that allows for a reorientation of our nail vector by 90 degrees. So this is nice because it is potentially very low energy. So what we can do is, we can get a reorientation of our nail vector by 90 degrees with just an electric field, no current needed. And that is very, very low power, can be theoretically in the septojoule power. Okay, that's great. Um, now, of course, this PNNPT material, again, it's not super compatible with CMOS. So the companies would rather like to have pure current induced switching. And this is something that, of course, um, we know very well from ferromagnets, where it's called spin transfer or spin orbit torques, and where essentially when you inject a spin polarized current from, uh, into a ferromagnet, then this spin current 
actually transfers its spin angular momentum on the direction of the ferromagnet. And that means all the ferromagnetic moments will rotate clockwise and the direction of the spin current spin has rotated counterclockwise due to conservation of angular momentum. But now what happens for an antiferromagnet? This first layer would like to rotate clockwise. The second layer would like to rotate counterclockwise, but that doesn't work because they're very strongly coupled. So will it work? Will it not work? It turns out that it can work if the two sub lattices actually orient, reorient in the same direction. And how can you get that to do? This was actually predicted first by Jakub Zeleshny. And so what he predicted is in special materials such as manganese to gold, where the manganese A and B sites are inequivalent, the torques acting on the two sub lattices can be different so that they rotate in the same direction together. And they are different because if you look at manganese A site, a single manganese A site atom, if it looks up, it has gold. A single manganese B site, if it looks up, it has manganese A site. And the four manganese B site, if they look up, they see a single manganese A site. And the four manganese A site, if they look up, they see a gold. So the A site and the B site, they're inequivalent. And that means the torques acting on the two sides can be different. And so you can imagine that as you have small coils wound around every atom, but with opposite winding direction for the A and the B side. So here it's counterclockwise, here it's clockwise. And so they generate effectively different directions of the torques. And so when we inject the current, they just together switch like this. And this is what you want. You want that the two sub lattices switch together by 90 degrees when you inject the current. And so this was first seen in this seminal paper by Pete Radley in copper manganese arsenide, and we looked at it in manganese to gold. So what we do is we inject a current along two perpendicular directions, and we expect that the two sub lattices will orient always perpendicular to the current. Current this way, then the two sub lattices go like this way. Par current that way, two sub lattices like that. So by varying the current direction by 90 degrees, we can reorient the nail vector by 90 degrees as well. And that's what we did. So here we can inject our current along the 110 and the 11 bar zero direction. And then we see that when we inject it along the 11 bar zero direction, the planar Hall effect or AMR goes down and along the 110 it goes up. And by injecting more current, we can also make it switch. So this was published in this paper here. And this allows us to demonstrate we can really switch the nail vector by 90 degrees. And that's of course great because now we can write manganese to gold and we can read it by coupling to permalloy. And so theoretically, we could make a device. Now, this is good, but the problem is this is limited to these very few materials that have this inversion symmetry. At the moment, we only know three materials, copper, manganese, arsenide, copper, manganese, antimony, and manganese to gold. Now, it would be much nicer if you could switch any antiferromagnet. And it turns out that is also possible, and that is possible if you put some platinum on top or below. So here we have a domain wall, and this effect was first predicted in this paper by Shino et al. and by Han Gomonai. And if we inject a current through the platinum, then the spin accumulation of the spin left electrons at the interface moves the domain wall, the antiferromagnetic domain wall. And the nice thing about this is that theoretically, the speed of this motion of this antiferromagnetic domain wall can be extremely high, just limited by the speed of sound, the magnon velocity in this material, which can be more than a few thousand meters per second. So this is really good. But there's also a problem because the direction of the, of the domain wall motion is set by its chirality. And if you don't have a symmetry breaking, then half of the domain walls will move right, half of the domain walls will move left, and in the end, there's no net switching. So how can we overcome that problem? Well, you need to have a second effect, and this is the ponderomotive force, which was put forward in this paper here, where if you inject spin polarized current again from a heavy metal like platinum, for 90 degree domain walls, you end up with a reorientation of the domains always in the direction perpendicular to the spins and the spin accumulation, and therefore you get a net switching of our domains. And that's what we wanted to see. Can we switch our nail vector deterministically in one direction? And for that, we made a sample 
nickel oxide with platinum. This geometry was first suggested here. And there's also relevant work here. And we inject current along two different directions, 90 degree different direction. And we hope that again, we reorient our two sublattices into 90 degree different directions. And indeed, while well, a lot of things are happening, so let me walk you through this slowly. Low current, nothing happens. Intermediate current, you see the resistance goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. So this would be compatible with this 90 degree switching back and forth. But if we increase the current density further, we see that first it switches one way and then it switches the opposite with the same current. And this shouldn't be. So spin orbit torques cannot switch first in one direction and then in the other for the same polarity. So something weird is happening. So the question is what of this signal that we measure is really magnetic switching? And if there's a non-magnetic part, what is the origin? And of course, what is the origin of the magnetic signal? So let me walk you through the answer to that. So how, to, how do we get the um, magnetic switching? Well, my favorite method is imaging. Let's just have a look. And here we are, we have a pulse, uh, so we have a cross with um, a nickel oxide platinum. We inject a single current pulse and bang. Everywhere where the current has been flowing, it has switched. Now we inject a current pulse in the perpendicular direction and bang, it switches back. So this means magnetically we can switch by 90 degrees the direction of our nail vector. So clearly there is magnetic switching. Now how much of that is actually reflected in the electrical signal? Now here when we compare the data from the electrical measurement and from the imaging, we see that initially they go in the same direction, but then the switch area saturate, but the electrical signal continues to increase and decrease. So it looks like the electrical signal actually mirrors initially the switching, but then it increases as well. And there's no magnetic change anymore. So what we can do is initially the switching is the same, but then we see that the switched area saturates. So no more switching happening, but the electrical signal continues to increase and we can subtract that additional increase and then it fits. But the question is, where does this additional increase come from? And to check that, we actually went to a different material, namely to cobalt oxide, because cobalt oxide has a nail temperature around room temperature. And this means we can measure in the magnetic and the non-magnetic phase. And that's what we did is we measured first below room to a nail temperature in the magnetic phase. And we see the same behavior as before. We see for low current density, no switching, intermediate current density switching up and down and high current density, we see this triangular switching. And if we now go above the nail temperature, so no magnetic effects, we see again, low current density, nothing happens, but intermediate current density, also nothing happens. And only high current density, we see this triangular switching. And it turns out that this non-magnetic effect is electromigration in the platinum. So when you put so much current through the platinum, we actually see that there is changes of the structure of the platinum. And that leads to this change in the resistance. So you have to be careful when you put so much current through that there are also non-magnetic effects happening. So the question is now finally, what is the origin of the magnetic signal? And to check that, we actually went to two devices where we can inject current either from left to right or in this flower geometry where in the center, the current is always flowing from left to right. In the center, the effect should be identical. But what we see is that the switching is in the opposite direction. So this means that we really cannot have any spin orbit torque effect that can explain this. But if we look at the sample and just remove the platinum, so there's no current flowing here in this ring. And we look at the switching, we see that everywhere it's black. And after switching, the current is just flowing on the outside it switches on the outside, but also on the inside. And when the current is flowing down, it also switches on the inside. So this actually is a thermomagnetoelastic switching mechanism, and it's not spin orbit torques. And the nice thing about this is that it also means you can actually have non-contact writing. Just by using a laser pulse, you can write the nail vector from le left and right or up and down. So this non-contact writing scheme can be much faster potentially because you can use femtosecond laser pulses rather than picosecond electrical currents. 
Okay, so we can do this. And also we are now looking at uh, trying to get spin orbit torque and I don't have the data here to show, but we also know in some materials we can get spin orbit torque switching. So we get magnetic switching and we can reveal it by direct magnetic imaging. We see also by transport the magnetic switching, but also electromigration effects. And we see thermomagnetic elastic switching mechanisms and also spin orbit talks actually that possibly we can now remove. We actually have some materials, but you also see spin orbit talk effects. Okay, so the summary here is there are many ways to write spin flop, magnetic elastic coupling, writing by currents. And you know, I'm not going to go through all this, but you will say now you can read and write. Why don't you simply make a memory? And actually, we did, not us, but our colleagues in Prague. This is now an anti-ferromagnetic memory, which we do wire bonding here on the chip. We actually have this in an Arduino board. And then this Arduino board can be plugged by USB into your laptop. And then we can have an anti-ferromagnetic memory. And OK, it's a one-bit memory, so storage density is not so great, but it works up to 12 Tesla. And I don't know of any magnetic memory that works up to 12 Tesla. OK. So now we have written and we have read the information so we can make a device. We come to the last part and that is transporting information. Okay, so how can we transport information in antiferromagnets and why should we use antiferromagnets to transport information? Now, the experiment we're doing is the following. We have our antiferromagnetic material and then we put two wires on top. One is the writing and one is the reading. One is the injector wire and one is the detector wire. And by the spin hall effect, we generate a spin accumulation at the interface to our antiferromagnetic insulator. And then this injects a spin current, a magnetic spin current into the antiferromagnet. This is then transported in the antiferromagnetic insulator. And then it is detected in a second platinum wire by the inverse spin hall effect. Okay, so now we are measuring the signal that is detected here as a function of the distance. Now, why should antiferromagnets transport spin at all? Now, in antiferromagnets, you have two, in uniaxial and isotopy antiferromagnets, you have two magnon modes. And these two magnon modes, they have opposite magnetic moment, meaning that if you have the same amount of mode one and mode two, then there is zero total spin transport. Now, same, same but opposite sign gives zero. But if we now bias by injecting spins of one direction and have more mode one than mode two, then we can have a net spin transport. And this is what we set to do together with our colleagues in Utrecht and in um, Trondheim. And we used for that hematite. Hematite is a uniaxial anisotropy material below the Morin transition. You see here the two sublattices uh, pointing up and down. And um, you can look at different surfaces, R plane, C plane, and so on. And what we can measure now is we can measure the distance depends of our spin transport. And just some advertising. Actually, we also have a new antiferromagnetic insulator beyond hematite that works, and we'll present it at the MMM conference. So let's check for hematite. How far do the spins go? And surprisingly, they go over very large distances. So we get spin transport over tens of micrometers, so 50, 100 microns. And why is that interesting? Well, if you talk to Intel in your processor, the biggest problem is heat. And the heat does not come from computation. The heat comes from the current going through the copper lines and that information transfer, because in the copper lines, you have ohmic losses. This is joule heating. And so you have 30 watts of power in 100 square microns. And this is the limit. And that means that you actually cannot increase the speed of your processor anymore because you can't get it cooled. So you'd like to transport information over tens of micrometer distance with very low dissipation. And that's possible in hematite. Now, you're not interested in transporting spins over five meters because you know a processor is 100 micron. But also the spins have to go a few microns. If they only go two nanometers, it's also not interesting. But that's exactly the length scale that Intel is interested in for low power dissipation transport. OK, so we can see it over 40 microns. That's really good. And we also identified there was a big discussion. Is it superfluid or diffusive transport? It's clearly diffusive because you have no threshold. 
and we have elevated temperatures and we see there's an exponential decay for large distances. So this works really well. Now, one of the problems that people always say is that, what is the origin? Why do this hematite show such long spin transport? And for that, we check the damping, the dissipation, and we measure FMR, the ferromagnetic mode here, and we find actually the damping is 10 to minus five or even smaller. So this has extremely low damping, as low as the best ferromagnetic material like YIG. And so this low damping enables this very long spin uh, transport. And if you're interested, here are the two papers. Furthermore, we also identify that we have right-handed mode um, and that's expected for hematite as well. Okay, so we have low damping material, but the problem is it's only uniaxial below the Morin transition, below 270 Kelvin. So it only works in your fridge or maybe in, the, you know, in Norway, but it doesn't work in Madrid because Madrid is too hot. So in order to make it work in Madrid, we need to have transport at elevated temperatures above 300 Kelvin. And so actually for that, we went to dope hematite to push this Morin transition to above 300 Kelvin. And then it works, you know, let's say at 310 Kelvin. So it's just okay for Madrid, but maybe not for Seville. So how can we get it to also work at higher temperature? And for that, we actually looked at the easy plane phase because above the Morin transition, the um, uh, hematite is an easy plane antiferromagnet. And it turns out that even in the easy plane phase, we get transport over micron. And that's actually is something that uh, Akash did the theory for. That's why he also we have a good collaboration with him in these two papers here, where he explained how the linearly polarized spin waves can lead to a superposition that has a circular polarization and transport spin even above room temperature in the easy plane phase. And that's really good because that means we can transport spin over long distances at room temperature or above. Okay, so that's a quick summary on the spin transport. So there's been a discussion on diffusive versus superfluid spin transport. There's an influence of domains and domain modes on the spin transport, so we can actually tune this. And there are also a lot of studies for vertical spin transport over short length scales and magnon spin modes. And now just one final advertising slide on skirmions because everyone is excited about skirmions. So we find in hematite anti-ferromagnetic anti-skirmions. If you're interested, here's the paper. There's also some interesting work from colleagues that have shown also merons in these materials. So skirmions can also be found in these antiferromagnets. And with that, I come to the most important slide because this is the people that did all the work. I just get to travel around the world or sit in front of my computer and give talks. So this is my group in normal times. This is my group at the moment. But fortunately, now we are more back to this than this. In particular, I acknowledge two excellent postdocs, Lorenzo Baldrati, who's been driving most of the switching, and Romain Lebrun, who's been driving most of the transport measurements, as well as my permanent staff scientist, Gerd Jakob, on the oxide work, Martin Jordan in charge of the manganese to gold, Hartmut Zabel, our senior professor, who told us a lot about magnetic scattering. And of course, nothing would work with great collaborations. So we work with people in Mainz and at Bessi, with people at NTNU, also Akash at the time at NTNU, and in Utrecht with people at Tohoku University, and Joe is now in Leeds, and actually Oleg is now in Sydney, and Rafael is here in Spain, in Santiago de Compostela, and people at the MPI in Stuttgart, as well as Thierry with Uri Novak. And I got some input for slides from Vincent Baltz and Takamoriyama, and we work, oh, sorry, again with Martin Evers as well. And uh, yeah, I acknowledge funding because experiments are expensive, in particular the IEEE Magnetic Society that funds my trip here. And so with that, I can summarize. So we can read antiferromagnets, we can do XMLD and Kerr imaging, we can do electrical readout by SMR, AMR imprinting. We can write antiferromagnets by currents due to spin orbitals and strain. And we can transport spin and antiferromagnetic insulators over long distances in this low damping hematite. And if you're new to the field, there are also some excellent general introductions, which I recommend to you. And with that, I'm uh, happy to see all of you here in person. I'm also here today. So if you want to talk to me, come and find me. If you're interested in the slides, send me an email. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Matthias. Very instructive and very interesting talk.
And uh, now I think we will start with the question from the audience here, and then we will go to Zoom if there are any questions here. So do you have questions? Please be active. If you shout, I can also repeat the question. Oh, yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the sintering? How crucial is the quality of the samples? Yes, I mean, it, it is very crucial. Um, for instance, in particular, maybe let me show you the manganese to gold. Um, I mean, here you see that the growth is super crucial. So actually part of the reason that this was published only now is that we have improved our manganese to gold growth so that we have pure manganese to gold phase. And only then we actually get this termination by the gold at the top surface. Um, if we have some other phases as well, then we can get termination with other atoms. And then this doesn't work. Then the exchange bias is super small. And for the nickel oxide, I should also acknowledge Rafael Ramos, who's really a wizard on the sputter machine now in Santiago de Compostela at the university. So he's been really optimizing the nickel oxide and cobalt oxide over many years. And we're very grateful to him for teaching us how to do this high quality sample growth. So these are all epitaxial materials. And that's maybe a big difference to ferromagnets and ferromagnets with like polycrystalline or amorphous cobalt iron boron, you can be happy. But for anti-ferromagnets, typically you need two different species of atoms like nickel and oxygen. And that means you need to have them ordered in order to have the antiferromagnetic order. And therefore you need perfect samples. So I think in antiferromagnets, it's more crucial than in ferromagnets. Yes, thank you for the talk, pretty nice. Uh, it's regarding the question, the previous question. If the fabrication process is very tricky and you have to be careful with this one and you say that this antiferromagnetic material is sensitive to the strains, uh, when you reduce the size, for example, you go to pattern, you are going to have some border effects also. It's going to affect to, the, to, to your responses somehow, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so so, so this is, a, is another very valid point. So, um, I mean, here you see typical devices. So indeed, when we do etching, we do some, um, uh, we do some um, damage at the edges. So what we do typically, there are two things that can happen. When you do etching in order to, to define a hole bar or something like that, if you etch for too long, you can heat the sample and that can lead to a degradation of the material. So for that, what we do is we do 10 second etching, 30 seconds wait, 10 second etching, 30 seconds wait to always make sure the sample doesn't heat too much. And then secondly, um, indeed, if you make the samples very, very narrow, like sub 100 nanometer, then you have to be very careful what you use as an etch mask. And uh, that is something where we have also developed some processes using hard masks, like chromium hard mask compared to um, using just PMMA. Um, and there indeed, it, it's something where you have to be careful and the very, very edge of your sample is then sometimes magnetically differently ordered. So that's something you have to be very careful that maybe at the edge you generate ferromagnetic ordering and these type of things. So there's also been quite a bit of development work into doing good patterning. In particular, also as many of these uh, samples are relatively thick, like for the nickel oxide, we have 90 nanometers and etching through 90 nanometers takes a long time and it's not so easy to get straight um, uh, sidewalls. Yes, so it's, it's tricky. So what we do is when you do argon etching, you rotate the sample and you, you tilt it in order to have a combination of like grazing incidents and straight etching. So yes, I mean, I'm happy to share the details with you. But even in the case that you make a perfect etching and the pattern will be pretty good, um, the atom just in the board is going to be relaxed a little bit. The position is going to be changed. Yes. And the properties is going to be a little bit different. Right? Yes, ab absolutely. Some border effect. Yes. So, I mean, this is something, let's say, I think when you go to like sub 10 nanometer sizes, where suddenly a large percentage of the atoms are at the edge, then this will become important. I mean, for our structures, which are typically 100 nanometer minimum width, we don't see a dominating effect, but there are reports that you can generate ferromagnetic edge states, for instance. Yes, so I mean, I, I completely agree, but the same at the surface. At the surface, you also have a finite, final layer. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. The problem is, can you control it? Yeah. So, so I think, yes. I mean, I think it's interesting. At the moment, we try to avoid it by making sure that the samples are not too narrow and by also making sure that we don't damage too far into the material, but really only the last layer at the edge. Maybe I also can take opportunity and ask you about your hematite. Yes. So as you said, the key point was a very small dumping. Is it something typical for antiferromagnets or the specific for hematite that the dumping is so small? Um, so yes and no. So firstly, there are also high damping antiferromagnets. I think that depends very much on the composition. So for instance, if you have rare earth involved, then you also get high damping. So rare earth materials like gadolinium or dysprosium or something like that, terbium. So I think that is no advantage over ferromagnets. Um, I think there are certain advantages of antiferromagnets. And what we find that if you use these, these um, orthoferrites, you can have very low damping if you have no magnetic rare earth in there. Um, but I think it's like in, in, in um, ferromagnets, if they're metallic, they tend to have higher damping just because you have just electrons as an additional degree of freedom, which, which increases the damping. So insulating antiferromagnet center of low damping, but also within the insulating antiferromagnet, there are only a few that have so low damping. And at the moment we know two, we know hematite and one other material, which I will present at MMM in early next year, where we see also extremely low damping and large uh, long spin, spin transport length scales. Uh, but I think there is no free lunch. I think you do get in metallic antiferromagnets, higher damping as you get in metallic ferromagnets. What about this manganese to gold and the copper magnets arsenide? What's yeah, I mean, I think they both don't have super low damping because they're both conducting. I mean, manganese to gold is really metallic. So I think it has sizable damping. We haven't quantified the damping, um, but we see, for instance, when we put permalloy on top, that the damping of the permalloy increases sizably if we put the permalloy on the manganese to gold. Copper manganese arsenide as a semiconductor could have a little lower damping, but I don't think that they will have the same low 10 to the minus five damping that we find in hematite. Maybe we can take now questions if there are some on Zoom. Elsa? So is there any question uh, on Zoom? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Thank you. And regarding this possible anti anti skirmium, mm -hmm. what are the properties expected? So this is a special beast here because it's an antiferromagnetic anti skirmion So it's topologically trivial. Um, so you would for instance, expect there is uh, no um, uh, uh, skirmion hall effect. So when you drive it, it would drive straight along the current direction and not have ha having a skirmion hall effect. Um, the problem is at the moment that we see these type of structures occurring in hematite, but we don't have a symmetry breaking mechanism leading to chiral skirmions. So this would be Lifshitz invariance where you need to have uh, inhomogeneous DMI, it's called, where you need to have a spiralization of your nail vector. So nail vector needs to lead to the spiralization with a fixed chirality. So this we have not seen. There is one report on manganese on tungsten 001 or something like this with a spin poised STM where they see a chiral nail vector, um, a spiralization. But in our case, we've tried to cap very thin material with platinum or tungsten we don't see chiral spin structures at the moment. So I would say this is nice because it exists, but it's at the moment not terribly useful, to be honest. <laughs> Continuing with this uh, anti skirmion so how stable are they? So in, in these, these ones, did you try to manipulate them by putting some platinum on top or something? 
Yeah, at the moment, they don't seem to move. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're stable up to six Tesla, which is a spin flop field. So at the moment, we can, I mean, we can kill them by uh, applying strong fields, like in the easy access phase, uh, you know, spin flop is you know, six Tesla or something like that. In the easy plane phase, it's a bit easier to manipulate them. But at the moment, we have not managed to manipulate them actively by putting current through. And this you can see, you know, it, there's also some, it's some, some random domain structure. I mean, there's nothing ordered about it. So I think that essentially it's governed by some pinning sites. And, you know, this just happened to be an anti-ferromagnetic anti scanning which just occurred at this pinning site. Okay. Uh, that, that's why we also published it PRB and we didn't try to submit it to. <laughs> But fundamentally, there's nothing that speaks against moving it by current. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally in a hematite, this can be moved. But maybe that's another thing that one should realize that antiferromagnets, you cannot grow them so thin. If you have interfacial spin orbit talks, you want to have a very thin magnetic layer. But antiferromagnets, because they comprise a unit cell, which is simply bigger than, say, cobalt, you need to make them thicker in order to get good quality. And that makes interfacial spin orbit talks interfacial DMI trickier. And how thick is the This was probably 30 nanometers. So few, I mean, typically we get tens, you need tens of nanometers of um, hematite in order to get a good Morin transition. If you make it, let's say five nanometers, then you get um, typically only the easy plane phase because uh, the quality is not as good. In cobalt oxide, nickel oxide, we can make it now two nanometers. Um, and that is, of course, very important if you want to induce interfacial DMI or interfacial spin orbit talks. But for that, you need a wizard like, like Rafael Ramos who can teach you how to grow this uh, very thin and high quality films. But hematite doesn't grow well so thin. So nickel oxide, cobalt oxide, yes. Uh, but hematite, uh, we cannot grow with high quality below tens of nanometers. Sorry, there is a question online. Okay, can you read it out because I can't um, see it? Yeah, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, I can now speak. Walter, oh, yeah. please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. How does the electromagnation uh, migration influence the magnetic structure? That's a very good question. Um, and typically what we find is that the electromigration, um, at least for this, let's say relatively small effects does not change the magnetic properties. So when we do imaging and concurrent readouts, so for instance, here in these samples where we have grown, actually, let me just go to one other slide. So, so here we have an example where we have lots of, so here we have lots of examples where we imaged and we checked um, and we found that um, the, the magnetic um, uh, structure does not seem to be influenced by electromigration. However, when we put too much current through so that the heating goes up, then eventually, in particular in cobalt oxide, which has this low uh, nail temperature of just around room temperature, then you can change locally where the current is flowing the magnetic structure due to heating above the nail temperature. But nickel oxide has 550 Kelvin uh, nail temperature. Uh, there we don't see any influence due to the electromigration because it's just on the surface and nickel oxide is pretty inert. Mm -hmm. How large are these images and how do you uh, obtain the images? How, how do we what? Obtain the images. Ah, okay, <laughs> yes. So these images are typically like 10 microns, something like that. Um, and um, we can obtain it either by Kerr microscopy or X-ray magnetic linear dichroism microscopy, like okay. photo emission or scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. Yeah, okay, good. So here, if you are interested, here is the paper where we discuss this also in detail. Yes, but thanks for asking. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that uh, Niel said it is useless. Well, um, yeah, but I mean, I think you know maybe at his time I probably would have said it's also useless. I mean, I think it's still, if you talk to Intel or Samsung, they still think it's pretty useless because they say if you have a readout that is 0.1% or 10 to minus five, SMR is 10 to minus five. Mm -hmm. There's no way they're interested in any technology mm -hmm. where, the in, where the information readout uh, contrast is 0.1%. It's only since we have shown 
that we can couple it to the ferromagnet where we have 100% or 200% TMR that they suddenly get interested. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, let us thank again Matthias for his talk. And uh, also thank you very much to all of you and to those who have been listening by other by electronic means. So thank you very much. Thank you. And again, if you're interested, send me an email and I'm happy to send you the slides if you have any questions. And great to see you all in person. Even the students, fantastic. Thank you, everybody online, too. Thanks for your participation. See you next Thursday. <laughs>